radio. Oh yeah, there goes there goes everything. Now we're live everywhere. <clears throat> live and ready to rock. We're good. <coughs> I'll tweet it out quick and we can jump right into it. Okay. Y'all ready? All right, we got a special episode for you tonight. We've got Paul Wheaton here. He is probably the loudest voice in permaculture. He's got a huge website called permies.com, and he's got a Kickstarter that we're going to have to touch on that's closing soon, probably before this comes out in audio, and also a fantastic book called Building a Better World in Your Backyard Instead of Being Angry at the Bad Guys. I love that subtitle, and uh, so welcome to the show, Paul. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Thanks, guys. I'm looking forward to this. Let's dance. <clears throat> yeah, this is going to be like a 101, permaculture 101. I mean, at least for me anyways. And, I mean, it's just such appropriate timing. I mean, we had this, uh, I got this email from our friend uh, who uh, we did a couple audiobooks for, and, and we ha had him on the show about uh, cancer and red light therapy. Uh, Mark Sloan, I think his name was. He's like, you got to have Paul Wheaton on. And because he's moved out, I think he's moved out east. I think he's moved on to some land out east. And I was like, I wonder what he's up to. And I and you must be getting a lot of interest now with all this. But I mean, I've been hearing people moving out of the cities and people moving across country now. And I, I just I'm interested in uh, in learning a little bit more about the basics about what you've been doing for I don't know decades now, like 10, 20 years, I guess. It's been a long time. I I do know that when everybody was on lockdown, like traffic to my site nearly doubled wow it may have doubled uh i mean one of the things that we have is something that we call skip uh skills uh to inherit property oh that's and, one of the ones i want to talk to you about yeah yeah so then basically we've got a list of like hundreds of little things that you can do and if you could just take pictures of it as you're doing it then um there are people on my site right now that are sitting on land and they're like i'll put you in my will you know i just Wow. I just need to know that there's some grit and substance to you. Yeah. And you're not just somebody saying, I have skills. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's like, uh, well, what have you done? And uh, like, let me let me see it so I can know that you really did it. Yeah. And uh, you know, and then also, are you just gonna if I if I if you inherit my property, are you just gonna sell it in a month because you know you ran out of dough? Do you have a way to, to, to bring in a few bucks, you know, to get by while you're getting started? And so we've got uh, all of that covered. We need, we have ways of a person being able to prove that they built this thing, they built that thing, that they brought in some money, that they did a little of this and a little of that. And then when there's enough of it, then a person can say, yeah, I'll will my land to you. Like, yeah. like for example, even just going out to, uh, you know, getting out of the, getting out of this rat race, right? People talk about how like it's hard to imagine when you picture moving out of the city and moving to land, and you know you've you've maybe quit your job, you might not have a lot of savings, you might be just going from scratch. You're learning how to like Darren's been learning how to hunt lately and process food, and which is fantastic. But I mean, but the the to move your home onto a piece of land seems overwhelming, you know, without the income and all that. But I've seen in, in your book, you know, you kind of guide people how to you how you can actually do that. There are some ways where you can start with land, start with a shack, you know, keep your job for a while, maybe, you know, start start really, you know, cutting down on your expenses and you can start building up on, on a piece of land, right? Well, it's like how much or how little do you want to go in? And um, and part of it is is like it seems like the pizza box keeps coming up. So, the, so I don't know if you read the part. Yeah, about, yeah, about I did. The, pizza yeah. Box. the war on the pizza box. Yeah. And it's kind of like, uh, all right, so you 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 got a pizza box, and now you can't recycle it because it's got food greasy bits on it, right? And it's like, uh, so what do you what do you do? And uh, <clears throat> there's levels of things you could do, but. I don't know. I, I, I seem to have gotten quite a few people that are obsessed about the pizza box 
And the thing that I said at the end, and it's kind of like, and it, it kind of goes like with along the idea of a, of a Tesla, buying a Tesla. And it's like, okay, sure, you can buy a Tesla. And uh, that'll cut two tons off of your 30 ton carbon footprint. Um, but you know what, what cuts even more tons off and what, what makes an even bigger dent is not driving your car. Like you could have a gas guzzling car and you just don't drive it anywhere, but it's like not from a point of sacrifice because most everything is about sacrifice. And it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? How do you, how do you get by in life not driving your car? And it's like, okay, so what if you had a scenario that was so sweet that you just didn't feel like going anywhere? Like you had the car sitting there, you had a gas guzzling beast brand new full of that new car stink and it's like it's ready to roll but you just don't feel like going anywhere it's like yeah 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 i've been there i'd rather stay here there's these people here that are like next door and there's these other guys over there and this gal she she can't stop cooking and now let's talk about the pizza box because like with the pizza box a lot of people say well don't don't have pizza delivered. And I say, that sounds like sacrifice to me because having that pizza show up at your door is pretty sweet. That's a, that's a smooth. I don't want anybody to sacrifice anything. I want to, I want to describe a far more luxuriant life. And if we can get there, then, then you get far more goodness, far, far more good stuff for you, far more comfort, far more luxury far more money in your pocket. So <clears throat> what's it look like when you retire, which is part of what you were talking about? Because it's kind of like, if you're going to retire and you're like old and stuff, you're like 80 and you're retired. It's like, what are you doing? What's that look like? Are you in Florida? Are you, are you, you know, on a little, you have a little garden that you putts around with? What do you do? What's your thing? If is is your work is that what defines who you are? Do you go because you just need something to do? Is that what your work is all about? And it's kind of like, all right, let's pretend you're retired, and then, but you retired to a spot that's sweet. It's like, man, this is this is fine living right here. This is really great. What does that look like? Then. I want it. And now it's like, it's so good. It's so good. You just don't feel like ordering pizza to be delivered. Somehow there's somebody right here, like either in the house or the house neck over who thinks you're cool or whatever. And they're like, and next thing you know, before you're even thinking about ordering the pizza, somebody says, Hey, we made some pizza. You want some? And you're like, man, this pizza is better than the stuff I used to order. Have you now eliminated the pizza box? And then it's kind of like, now how do we get there? And that's part of that uh, devious uh, uh, financial strategies chapter. And it's kind of like, all right, let's get you retired way early. Let's get through this. Now, depending on how hard you're willing to do this, how much you want this, how much you want this particular destination, and then, of course, the path that's provided to get there, take as much or as little as you want. Yeah, well, there's definitely a push pull to the to the city and now away from the city. I mean, I don't know if you've seen interest since, you know, I know you said there's the traffic's doubled since the lockdown, but I mean, I, we've been we've been hearing lots of people wanting to think about buying land or getting off off the grid a little bit. I mean, I don't know how off the grid sort of your, you know, Wheaton eco scale is. If that off the grid is on that scale somewhere, we'll have to talk about that later. But um, the pizza box, you also had a couple other options in there. You know, you're like. You go through the the levels of okay, well, maybe you could use the box in your garden or something, right? But then it might have chemicals in it, or maybe like there's wax paper under the pizza, and maybe you throw away that and you can recycle the box. But I mean, so there's a bunch of options in between. But ideally, you get to that point where yeah, you don't you don't want to order it. So like most permaculture people, and a lot of permaculture people would get here from gardening, but right, right. Um, there's a lot of perma most permaculture people would be like cool with taking that box. And composting it, or uh, uh, you know, using it in their horticultural endeavors. And I'm one of the ones that are like, no way, never. I think there's toxic gick in the cardboard. 
And mm. I, I don't want that in my stuff because I, I also kind of feel like another angle on the whole book is um, your toxic footprint. And I get contacted by a lot of people who are in the throes of cancer or some other ailment. And it's like, uh, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. And um, I kind of feel like, what? No, I've, I've been sharing this stuff for decades. It's, it's pretty basic, simple stuff. I mean, and then they're, they're like not doing any of it. Yeah, it's and strange it's, how it overlaps with health and wellness. I mean, it's really interesting that. Yeah, I, I, I honestly believe that I'm on to a cure for most cancers. And um, and because I have this crazy theory, bear with me, guys. No problem. <laughs> I think I think cancer comes from carcinogens. Now, don't quote <laughs> me because you know I'm sure that's going to stir up some trouble. But I think it's not just the carcinogens we know about, but also the carcinogens we do not yet know about or might never know about. I think all of those cause cancer, and it's like America seems to be. And, and I'll even go so far as to say most of the world seems to be pretty locked into how cancer comes from the cancer fairy, just randomly going around and ting, you got cancer. Oh, no. How unlucky of you to have gotten cancer from the cancer fairy. It's, it's like uh, it's a random thing. It just randomly happens. Nothing causes it. The only one that we agree has a cause is smoking. And when, when people are smoking, it's like, okay. That'll give you cancer. That one, that one, but nothing else. Not gl not glyphosate. Not anything else. No. Not that new car smell. That doesn't give you cancer. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it does. It totally does. Uh, I I remember uh, like 20 years ago there was a joke that bras cause cancer, and and then I got chastised that that's just a mean thing to say, and that I'm just after one thing for women to go <laughs> running around that bras, and I I could. I confess <laughs> there may be some truth to that. So, but uh, later it turned out to be totally true. They do cause cancer. It's been proven. <laughs> so, all right. The moral of the story is, is that there's a lot of stuff, just, just oodles of it. And so I, I feel, so this, this recently a person contacted me and, and uh, they, they're a friend. And, and they're struggling. And I'm like, well, okay, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this. And there's some movies you got to watch that are just very powerful in this space. And, um, but the but top of the list, have you, have you eliminated all food that's not organic? Well, that's just a bunch of hooey. No one believes that. But yeah, you mean all those people that are no one that, that have cancer? And then, and then they're really no one because they died of it? Those people, you know? And it's like, so let's let's take another look at this. You have cancer and I don't. Maybe that has some weight to it. Plus, I've got some podcasts with some people where we worked with them to get through their cancer. And um, and and it's like uh, one gal, she was an or organic farmer. And I I went to her house and I dug through her bag and I just went through all her stuff. And it's like, no, she just had it everywhere. And right. it's like, so we got rid of so much stuff and then the cancer went away. Wow. And, and wow. it's like, uh, and that's what I want to do. I'm, I'm up here in Montana. We're building a property. We've got a place built. It's, it's almost done. And uh, it has uh, no cement. Um, it has uh, very little plastic. And that plastic has, is from billboards, old billboards. And so it's been already off gassed. Um, <clears throat> but very little of that. Other than that, no other plastic uh, or cement or paint, plastic or paint, uh, no glue. There's no glue in the whole building. And um, the floors um, are cob, which is going to be uh, sand and clay, a little bit of straw, and then we finish them off with a little bit of linseed oil. Um, and uh, so anyway, this, this building is a very, very, very natural building. The foods that we're growing are, we're, we're improving the soil at that site right now in order to be able to grow foods with a polyculture and with very rich soil. And I personally believe that these foods and the structure would be able to, like somebody, 
could show up with stage four cancer and it'll go away in a week. Because, and it's like, I see pictures of people with cancer in a hospital, children, and, and it's kind of like, I'm just looking around the room that they're in and I'm just thinking like, that causes cancer, that causes cancer. All the things in the room that are there as part of their treatment are things that I believe cause cancer. And so I just kind of feel like if we, if we want to, and maybe, maybe this is a, a new form of Darwinism at work, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's like, if it, you're either going to get rid of all the toxic kick in your life and then be able to reproduce or there's the alternative. Well, it's going to come pretty, <clears throat> it's going to come pretty swift. I think the, the choice will come pretty swift with what's going on in the world right now, whether it's a, you know, an RNA changing vaccine or whether it's, uh, you know, just having to move to the cities and I don't know, it's, it's getting crazy out there. So the, the, the organic thing is, is, uh, you know, I, I buy I buy my bread from a place that can't say they're organic, although they say they're organic. You know. Yeah. Um, no. And that's a bit of. a They don't problem. want to pay the organic penalty. Yeah. The government's like, well, if you're going to call it organic, you got to pay us. Yeah. I and liked so your I liked your I liked your idea about the reverse organic. They should yeah. tell you why it's not organic. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like here's food. We don't even use the word organic anymore. This is food. And then uh, uh, this is this one over here is GATT. This is called uh, the government uh, has uh, and so what the reason they use medicines to get this food. Oh, we've lost you. We're losing you. Hello. Hear me now? I yep. can hear you now. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I should have switched over to my better internet before we started. That's okay. All right. So yeah, so, you were, you were in the middle of saying uh, you know they should probably label it GAT. Label for, the food for GAT. government accepted acceptable levels of toxicity. <laughs> yeah. And the label should say what is the toxin that's being used? Why? Yeah. How did it get there? What's the story with it? Yeah. All right, you can talk for three seconds, and I'm going to be um, silent for three. All right. So I'm interested in uh, the energy production at his okay. place and see how, how much of that bread you eating. A little too much of it. A little too yeah, much. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got no preservatives or you know anything like that. It's just your bread. It's the bread you always told me is okay. What's that? The sourdough. Very few in in ingredients, you know. There's no, it's not it. though, because you're going to that Cobb's and you're just getting it from there. <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of All energy right. in your new place there what what kind of en what do you got for energy i mean i've heard you talk about i mean the the you know the amount of energy used for heat and using different light bulbs is a great trick and the the rocket oven i mean maybe start maybe talk about some trip uh tricks uh that you have over there or how you've how are you doing doing that in your new in your place there in montana so we have uh two properties uh one property is 200 acres and that was bare land and we're doing some natural building on that. And uh, uh, that's where we've got Allerton Abbey, our first Wafati uh, built. And um, is, uh, you know, we're getting it, we're just finishing it up. And um, we've got a, a couple of other things to do on it. But anyway, we're building the gardens around it and trying to get them to have good rich soil. Then uh, nearby is a, a, a smaller property that we have that's on the grid and and uh, we call that base camp okay and so it has internet and uh it has you know uh, grid power and uh you know all the all the normal things that a rural property would have and uh and so when we're building things we've got a, a full shop and so you know tools power tools and uh, welding equipment things of that nature and then um, we're trying to you know build this paradise up on the other 200 acres okay awesome and we had Joel Salton on once, so I think you you kind of described some of what he does with that poly poly farming, that kind of thing. So you're reclaiming the soil by right, yeah, right. Joel Salton does some amazing things. Um, <clears throat> Joel Salton's uh, uh, his his approach is very much like, uh, okay, I have sixty acres, 
how do I get $100,000 out of the 60 acres? Right. And so he wants to work the land to get that $100,000. Um, I would say that my approach is more like I want one person to have three acres. And rather than talking about how to make big money off of it, how to completely meet all their own needs, how to basically retire with a humble home and a massive garden to the point where it pumps out without, while you're ignoring it, it just pumps out more food than you can eat. Right. And then it's like, yeah, maybe you can sell some of the extra, you know, yeah, yeah, get a yeah. couple of bucks here and there. Yeah. But it's like, <clears throat> if you're retired, then you don't really need the money. And, uh, and then if you've got neighbors that you consider to be good, they're, they're great neighbors by your values, then uh, you kind of get to that state where it's like, no, I'm, I'm all set. I, I'm cool being here all the time kind of a thing. So Joel is about chasing the dollar, which I think is great. I'm, I'm a big fan of people chasing that dollar. That's, that's kind of how you go and get your, your grub stick, get it all. all. Um, <clears throat> but then there's like, I, I, I would advocate, I call it gertitude. And I wrote about it in the book a little yeah. bit, the story yeah. of Gert. Yeah. How to, uh, basically I introduced the idea of a permaculture millionaire. So if Gert, uh, has has her humble home and her big garden, and she's got her lovely neighbors, and everything that she's doing just makes her happy. And then I give her a million dollars. Here you go, Gert. You can spend it on anything you want. It's all yours. Million dollars. And if she changes nothing, she and it just sits in the bank or whatever. I think it's safe to say that Gert is a permaculture millionaire. Yeah, yeah, I like that philosophy. Yeah. So, so you wanted to talk about energy. Well, Rocket yeah, cause, yeah, yeah, sure. I guess because that's part of, you know, how that person retired is going to live in a, in a warm house in Montana through the winter, for example. But also just a little bit more on that on that part where you, you were reclaiming the how long does it take to reclaim the soil? For example, if you're shifting your animals around on it and you're growing multi multi multitude of plants, like, is that something that happens fairly quickly or how do you? Oh man, you're gonna hate this answer. No, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Almost all questions in permaculture, the answer is it depends. It depends yeah. <laughs> yeah. It depends. I mean, like, <clears throat> yeah, you're starting off with desert because there's yeah. some so there's some places I've been to where it's like it's a jungle. You walk, you get there, and it's already a jungle, right, and they've right. got like 60 inches of rain a year. It it rains like every three days, only at night. And uh, it's just perfect in every way. And the, you start digging a hole, it's black soil. And you go down six feet, and it's still black soil. Well, okay, whatever you're going to do there, it's going to go, it's going to be quick. You're going to, you're going to make a permaculture paradise there real fast. Um, but if you're starting off in a desert, that's a lot of sand. Uh, it's going to take some time. But, but the thing is, is it's like, you start, you start with a desert and like nothing's growing there. It's like cracked clay or, or it's dunes or whatever is the, the, the view that you picture is like the world's most miserable spot for trying to grow anything. It's like, it's a, it's amazing what a permit can do there to green the desert. Uh, <clears throat> so it's like, there's, it, we can do it. It just, it just takes more time. It's going to yeah. take a few years. Um, uh, some people can do it without adding any water and some people do it with adding some water. It's part of it is, is do you have any water at all? Yeah. And so for us, uh, we've got, um, what might be called a conifer desert. So there's trees growing here, lots of these conifer trees, but they're kind of, uh, they're kind of a little bit greedy with the water and they, tend to make it so that uh, they desertify an area. <clears throat> a lot of times there'll be a creek running and then there's a bunch of conifer trees and then the creek isn't running anymore. Right. And it's kind of like, uh, well, what happened? And it's like, well, those trees don't have a tap root and, and they, don't, they don't share the moisture that they find. They hold on to it. Um, whereas there's other trees 
where they'll have a tap root or whatever their system is and they'll take water in, but they have a lot of root exudate that's loaded with water. And so they kind of, in a way, share water with their neighboring plants. But conifers tend to not do that. Hmm. So um, you're asking me, like, how quickly can we do that? And it's kind of like... That's hard. Yeah, it's hard to say. I think, yeah. I think it's uh, two or three years yeah. to have yeah. good, rich soil, yeah. good, beautiful, rich soil. That's not um, bad. And that's, I mean, I, I just didn't know if it was worth. like two or three or 10 or 12, you know, I mean, on the, on the worst case. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that if you're in the Sahara Desert, where it's dunes and you don't have water, I think you're looking at 10 years yeah. to get to the point that you've got a good soil yeah. and, and you can grow things there without irrigation. Yeah. But it can be done. But so now, because we're, we have a similar, I think, uh, we're a desert base. We're in, Al we're like, we're in oh, Alberta. Same as you. Yeah. Similar to Montana. Some of the, uh, probably only four hours away. Yeah. Four wow. Five hours away from each other. Yeah. You just got to get across the government line. Yeah, exactly. I got that treaty card might still work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Montana's basically desert. It must be similar to here. You know, it's funny. Uh, it It is, but it's like I'm in the Rocky Mountains. So, like, if you're in Missoula, you get 13 inches of rainfall per year. But when you look around... You can see a variety of different trees and growth and stuff on the untended hills, uh, except for the stuff that's kind of south facing. It's you know, or the, um, the the lee side of the mountain. It's it's you know, those are pretty dry and barren. But then you kind of go over to Great Falls, and you're now kind of getting into the plains. Yeah, and the wind just blows forever. Right, and it just blows and blows and blows. <laughs> And it's kind of like they get the same amount of rainfall that Missoula does, but it looks five times drier. I mean, you can look for 20 miles in every direction and you'll see six trees, you know, and, and it's like, wow, this is this is desert. This is desert country. But the same rainfall as Missoula, it's kind of part of what is a big part of permaculture. Is you have your observation like this, like clearly the mountains are slowing the wind down. Because you're in Missoula, you get wind once in a while, but you don't get it like Great Falls where it's just all the time. You just, just once in a while, there's a wind, a strong wind or a light wind or a breeze. And then the rest of the time, so where I'm at, I'm, I'm a little ways away from Missoula. And so the mountains are a little closer together and we get even less wind. And so we get more moisture. Everything's a little greener here. I really noticed this, that moving from Vancouver to Calgary, Vancouver being so low to the sea, Calgary being way up here, and then moving, uh, went to a, to a golf a golf game once in uh, Pemberton, just north of Whistler, and realizing you're in this valley, this green valley, and there's no wind. And I was like, this it's the first time in years I'd felt no wind. Because here, there's just always wind blowing. This is always there. You kind of get used to it and you forget about it, but Until that must make windy. it a little bit more difficult difficult to... To homestead, probably. Well, think about like back in Vancouver. <clears throat> the, the general wind direction is coming from the ocean. Yeah. Which is why over the Olympic Peninsula, they have the whole rainforest. And so there's just this moist air coming off the ocean headed in. But now go down to Los Angeles. The general air direction is from the desert out to the ocean. And so it's a, it's a desert there. Yeah. And San Diego as well. Um, it's just dry, dry, dry. But they're they're down where you'd think there'd be more moisture, where there'd be more more jungle. Yeah. You know, but it's not. It's it's the desert is the desert air is moving out to the ocean. Whereas in Vancouver, so it's like it, it is. It's about different climates for different areas, and uh, and then we could talk about microclimates, how to cause this, which I think is important, because in Missoula we got the mountains kind of blocking the wind. And then uh, if you're in Great Falls and you're trying to grow a jungle in the middle of Great Falls or you've got yourself an acre on the edge of Great Falls and you want to grow this jungle, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to, you want to reduce that wind because that wind is just going to, everything you put out there, it's just going to, to dry up into little plant jerky in no time. <laughs> yeah. And so... 
Uh, the thing I recommend is building some berms around your garden. That way the wind goes over your garden. And now you've got hardly any wind inside where your garden is. And suddenly uh, uh, all this you know, shift in the, the wind makes it so that uh, there's actually more moisture being released on your property. It, the, the wind picks up the moisture in other places, and then it gets to this weird spot that's your place, and suddenly there's all this extra dew on everything. Huh. How tall of a berm would that take? I would like to recommend a berm that is 15 feet tall. Wow. That's a big-ass berm. You see some of those around some of the fields around here, though. Instead of having some of them will have trees sort of planted between to stop the wind, and other ones will just plow up a bunch of dirt. Right, right. The, just the trees It's is an old-school form of windbreak. They've proven that if you place trees just you know close enough together that enough wind goes over that you um, actually get, like if you've got, uh, let's say, 100 acres, and you plant 10 acres and trees, and you used to get 100 units of crop, that now you get 110 units of crop from the same 100 acres because of the trees. Huh. And then if you're super smart, you planted some kind of species of tree, which throws off a crop of its own. So, but then yeah, other places are gonna do a berm. A berm is far more effective than that windbreak at being a windbreak. So the, the berm is really good. But yeah, you look around at those berms and you'll see where they've got them built. You look inside where they've got a few berms set up and it's like, notice that's a lot greener in there. Is that part of the reason why they built those little rock walls in Europe and Ireland and all that? You see them all over the gar all over the fields? I wonder if that was windbreak at all. I imagine that it had some windbreak behavior, but they're so low to the ground yeah, that, yeah. that it's probably not a whole lot. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the natural part of that you'd see here is the coolies. All the coolies in the fields are just teeming with life. Like drive down from the plains, it's all dry. Drive down there, whether there's a river running or not, that's always a little greener. You ready to talk about rocket mass heaters? Yeah, let's. Uh, let's. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> all right, you, you touched on it a little bit earlier, and so uh, let's let's start with a couple of things. We talked about this. We talked about uh, the. I'm going to go with Americans, all right? Yeah. Um, because I, I don't, I imagine that the Canadian carbon footprint is pretty similar, but I don't know. Uh, the American. Ours is more polite. <laughs> a. Uh, so the American carbon footprint is 30 tons per year. And uh, keeping all your same driving habits and buying a Tesla, that cuts two tons per year. If you're in Montana or a similar cold climate and you switch from electric heat to a rocket mass heater, you cut your carbon footprint by 27 tons. Wow. Most of it's heat. Most yeah. of it's electric heat. So, I mean, and, and natural gas, I believe, if I remember correctly, is closer to 19 or 20 tons. Um, but uh, with a rocket mass heater, and this is, this is a wackadoodle device. It's something you build yourself in a weekend. Um, it's a wood burning contraption. It heats your home with about one tenth the wood of a conventional wood stove. Have you guys ever heated a home with wood? I've, I've been in homes heated by wood. Yeah. Okay. I lived in one for a couple months. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you've been down that road. Yeah. Um, so it heats your home with one tenth the wood. And, and uh, I think, I think that if from the very beginning, if we started saying like it cuts your wood bill by 30%, I think far more people would have jumped on rocket mass heaters. But when we say it cuts your wood by 90%, then a lot of people are like, I'm out. That's, it's that's just, just too, not too much? possible. Too, it's, too it's, high up on the eco scale? Violates the laws of <laughs> physics or something, you know? So in fact, we've actually heard that. <clears throat> and it's kind of like, actually... What it does is it exposes where uh, certain entities have been lying to you for years is, is what it does. <laughs> but it's actually not that difficult. Um, uh, when you run a conventional wood stove, you need to get a lot of heat to go up the chimney because you want to try and burn all that creosote out. 
And um, so what happens is, is your exhaust temperature at the top, your smoke coming out the top of the chimney, that by law needs to be 350 to 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I, I don't know what that would be in Celsius. Uh, it's okay. We go back and forth anyway. So, okay. All right. All right. Uh, but with a but with a rocket mass heater, what it does is it has an internal chimney that is designed to superheat all of the exhaust gases, all the smoke, all the creosote, all that stuff, and so it basically domesticates the chimney fire. And so we're so not only uh, are we burning all that smoke and creosote as an additional fuel, but now our exhaust gases are anywhere from 70 to 140 degrees instead of that 350 to 600. I mean, that one's pretty simple right there. I think. I mean, it's like rather than rather than having all this heat go outside your home, you're keeping it inside. Yeah, yeah. But what's the? And you're just there's a functional difference though, right? I mean, how does it look? Like, is it? Oh, I've seen pictures yeah. of how you have it on. Almost like in a bench or low, low rising. So explain the yeah. process a little bit. It is different. So like a, a conventional wood stove is kind of a metal box, right? You kind of build a fire in it and you try to get the heat out of it right away. Like there's a, you, you basically want a fire in the middle of your living room, but you just don't want the smoke. So you came up with this metal box. So now they've, Come up with optimizations for the metal box, but let's just skip past all of that because we don't we don't need it. Let's just think about that's a metal box. You get the heat out right away. Now let's talk about a rocket mass heater. We're going to have this fire in an insulated box. And then we're going to have the first three feet of chimney be super duper insulated. So now in the, met in the metal box with the conventional wood stove, you're seeing something on the order of 900 to 1100 degrees because as it gets hot in there, we're extracting all that heat right away. But with the rocket mass heater, it's an insulated box. So we're seeing temperatures in there uh, exceeding 2000 degrees. And so that's what's burning all the smoke and, and then also uh, burning all that creosote. But now what comes out is just steam and CO2. And instead so, of exhausting it up through a chimney, you're exhausting it down to, to naturally sort of raise up into the air? Oh, right. What comes out of our little stubby chimney is now exceeding 2,000 degrees. Well, we don't want that going out the roof. We want to harvest that heat. But right now right. our okay, exhaust okay. is so clean. Yeah. The first thing we do is usually there's something cylindrical that goes over the top. So then the, the heat will hit the top of the cylinder, go around the sides, and that gets collected at the bottom. And, and that way you get your instant heat, your short-term heat. Then we'll take that exhaust and we'll run it through a mass of some sort. A lot oh, of times okay. a bench. Yeah. And then we'll and then we'll run it up out the roof. And then our exhaust, like our exhaust temperature will be low enough that you can it'll be a single walled thing and you can put your hands on it. You can touch it. It's it's like you know, it'll feel warm. If you get if you've been running a fire for a full hour, it'll feel hot. Like like, oh, I don't want to touch that for any length of time. It'll, it'll be like scalding hot water hot. So um, the key is we're going to heat your home with one-tenth the wood. And the exhaust is going to be something with about one one-thousandth of the smoke. Often about the same amount of smoke that you would get from burning a candle. Wow. So is that a standalone box? Like instead of having a little electric heater box, I've just got this little box that I take and put in my house, or does this need to be a piped in like a furnace more like something like that? Oh man, it's worse than that. It's, it's huge. I mean, there's a thermal mass in there. So part of the, part of the thing is, is like, if you've got wood heat, then there's a lot of people who are trying to like, just do wood because they can afford that. They'll go out and rip up a tree and bring it back and like you know, do that. And so they're trying to not use any of the other forms of heat because it'll be too expensive. So they're doing just wood. But what they find themselves doing is they're getting up at two o'clock in the morning to stoke the fire. But with a rocket mass heater, we've got this huge mass. And it the just mass holds might... the heat, stays hot. Sure, but, but it's huge. And so then that's, that's what Darren's asking about. Like, is it a little box? And it's like, no, no, it's huge. It's huge and it's heavy. 
heavy, tons. It weighs tons. And then, yeah, we route the exhaust to this very heavy, very large mass. And then the mass extracts all the remaining heat. And then the exhaust goes outside. Right. right. Steven CO2. Now the mass throws off this low heat for days. So I'll run a fire in the morning. I'll get the temperature in the house up to 72. And then I'll, the fire will go out and I'll forget about it and whatever. And I'll walk away. And then the house is comfortable uh, all day. And then I'll go to bed and I'll get up in the morning and it's 69 in the house. I never had to get up in the middle of the night. Yeah. And so it's like, so usually through most of the winter here in Montana, I run a fire about an hour every other day. And the amount of wood I burn at any given time is is small. It's like this. So this it's is like you little, can even take twigs that fall in your yard. You clean up your yard, use twigs, stuff like that. You can use all, all kinds of little things. And that'll, yes, that'll help. I uh, th- I about three years ago, I carefully measured all the wood that I burned. Oh, OK. And we kept this house. The coldest it ever got in this house was 66 degrees. This is a three bedroom house in Montana. Not particularly well insulated. And we heated this house with 0.60 cords of wood. So imagine a box that's four feet by four feet by four feet. And exactly what you're saying. Go out and like, you know, oh, there's there's some branches in the yard that fell off the yeah. tree. <laughs> All right. Cut them up and throw them in the box. Most people are going to cut them up and throw them into the green bin, right? And so then off it goes to the recycling center or whatever. I'm saying cut them up, throw them in this box instead. So it's basically free. You know, you still cut it up and throw it in a box. I'm just saying a different box. Yeah. Then throughout the year, it, it dries in there. It turns into dry firewood. And you filled this box up to heaping. All right? Because if, if that box is level, that's 0.50 cords of wood. So I'm saying, oh, yeah, make it kind of heaping. Add a little bit more to it. And that, four feet by four feet by four feet, I don't know what, 1.2 meters by 1.2 meters by 1.2 like meters. <laughs> then um, <clears throat> uh, a box of that size, which is not a huge box, but that will heat your home all winter. Wow. So, hey, and if you want to, if you, you, I mean, like you guys probably have, natural gas heat where you're at right now yeah and it's like it's on a thermostat and and it's like if you were to leave for two weeks then it comes on and it keeps your house warm and it's like okay go ahead and leave that there now let's turn around and add a rocket mass heater and then every other day you burn a fire for an hour and then your natural gas bill drops to zero but if you're gonna leave for uh, two weeks then it's like the natural gas will cover you. No yeah, problem. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how big is this multi-ton device then? Like the size of a shed? <laughs> or like, can you do? You, no. Is it used for other, like, functionally used for other purposes as well? Can I cook on it? Ooh, good question. Let me come back to that question first. Let me talk about the shed-sized rocket yeah, mass heater. Yeah. I would say like the one that's here in this house because I've got eleven. I've got all kinds of different structures here because we're doing so much stuff. But the one in this building here, I would say, is about and I'm going to try and say meters, a meter wide. And I'm going to say three meters long and like less than a meter high. Is that about right? Maybe, maybe two and a half meters long. You can stick and, with feet if you want. Cause most of our, we, we know feet just as well okay. as Americans. And right, most of our right. listeners are in America and we should be using the Imperial system anyways. Like I just want to go back <laughs> to that. So. I like, I like the beauty of the imperial system. It's got character. It's got, you know? uh, it's got, it's, it's sacred. I, I think there's a fun, it's like Harry Potter money. <laughs> Harry Potter money sounds like a hoot, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like that. It's character. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. Tangent. Three feet by probably nine feet, maybe eight and a half feet long. And so that's the, that's the mass. Yeah. And it's probably about two and a half feet tall, two to two and a half feet tall, something like that. Okay. I mean, you could sit on the mass. You could sit on it. Yeah. It's like, a, it's like a tall bench. 
There you go. That's would, the one that's here. Would that be piped into your your vent system at all then, or is it just like a hot box sort of thing that just is like a what's the word for it when it's just uh, radiates heat? I forget. Convection? I'd, I'd say here it's a it's a hot box thing. I mean, I think that one of the things you could do, and we've done it here a couple of times, um, and I don't even remember why we did it, but um, uh, like we've got there's a central heater here with a fan, and and sometimes we just turn the fan on and let it circulate the heat all around the house. But we've only done that like twice. Um, for the most part. If I'm in a room and the room is starting to feel a little cold, I'll realize, oh, I've got the door closed. I'll just open the door, and the next thing you know, it's it's nice and warm in here. But this rocket mass heater is centrally located in this house. Now, if you've got like a, I'm gonna sorry, I'm gonna use feet here. If you've got like a 6,000 square foot house and it's just spread out, it's just a massive long thing. I would imagine that you might have two or three rocket mass heaters at different places within the house. Okay. But if you run the one that's in the middle, then the stuff, then the, the, the rooms on the other ends of the far ends of the house could become much cooler, like significantly, like, like uncomfortably cool, but maybe that's okay. And then like, when you want them to be warmer, then you just fire up the rocket mass heater that's down on that end of the building. That's where I could keep my meat in the winter. <laughs> so, so here's a fun experiment, maybe. Like, uh, I'm actually right now going back and forth on uh, I don't want to lose my garage this winter because it's not heated. And I've been kind of playing with options or what are my options are to heat my garage. If I, like, uh, if I just leave the door to the house open because it's attached, it's going to cost me a fortune of natural gas. If I, I could put in a wood stove or something like that, but... You know, would this be the sort of option it'll get for too that? Because like, it'll get too cold in there. Yeah, like when it's winter and it's minus thirty or minus forty outside, it's like my garage is going to be minus thirty or minus forty. The same, whatever the temp is, is outside is bad, inside. Man. It might be a little bit because there's no wind, but yeah. I mean, for the most part, unless you heat it somehow, it's going to be as cold as it is outside. Is this something that me, like living in town, I'm just in a little town, fifteen thousand people, can this something I can throw in my garage easily? Is it is the garage uh, is it insulated? The walls are insulated. The ceiling is not. But if you drywalled okay. the ceiling, it would be insulated, I suppose. You, you, well, if you drywalled it with insulation in it, all my storage stuff is up there. We'll count that as the insulation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it doesn't count, man. <laughs> it doesn't count. Uh, let's pretend for a moment that you insulate it. What temperature do you want it to be in there? Like. I mean, sixty or above ish. You know, I don't put my car oh, wow. in there or anything. Like I like, I use my garage for a lot of things. Like whether it's butchering meat or I'd like to just have the use of my garage as like an extension of my home to do the things that are a little too dirty to do in the house. Okay. All right. All right. So like you got like a, maybe a little wood shop in there, maybe or yeah, exactly got... stuff like that. Okay. Yep. So um, you're not spending an enormous amount of time in there. It's like, but basically what you're saying is, is that I'd like to be able to go in, in there at any time. Like, I don't want to, like, I thought about the wood stove idea because I used to have one back home when I grew up with my parents. But I remember it was always like when, when dad had to go to the garage, it was always like, okay, well, he had to go light the fire, like, you know, three and a half or four hours before he goes out there. And I'm not that coordinated yeah. of a dude, you know, like I'm sporadic yeah. and all of a sudden it's like, Hey, I'm okay. going to go in the garage and do this. Okay. All right. All right. How often do you go in there to do stuff? A few nights a week. Okay, so let's say it's, let's say three times a week, you want to go in there for about four hours and do a thing. Is that fair? Yeah. All right? Yeah. Good enough? Yeah. Okay. All right. And when you go in there, you want it to already be warm. You don't want to be fucking around with some, uh, like, you know, stoking the fire and it's like, man, it's, 20 below out here it's yeah like, yeah it's my smoking lounge too kind of for my uh there's frost on my tools <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is unacceptable i i put a water jug out here and now it's a block of ice I like you've even got the canadian accent i like it that's good oh have i i 
He's close enough to the border that it just sort of seeps in. Just, does, I, I, don't, I don't know. I make these stupid voices, and people try to say, was that like an attempt at Scottish? No. No, it wasn't an attempt at anything rational or possible. <laughs> it, was, it was just a weird thing that came. All right. So uh, I, got a, I got a couple things. First, first insulate it if you just simply insulate it the fact that it's next to your house because it sounds like it's an attached it's garage it's attached yep correct yeah then you know the heat that's from your house on that shared wall is is going to kind of heat that space and in fact let's suppose that you insulated your garage and you you didn't want to heat it you just left it alone that extra insulation on your garage will act like an extra layer of insulation on that wall house. of the house, and it'll help a little bit. And I could insulate but, it in a in a weekend, easy enough. It's only the the roof to do, so that'd be an easy enough okay. project with some poly and some all right. insulation. All right. No now, plastic. Uh, no, no toxins. I'm not that far down the road yet, so I'm going to use. <laughs> not that yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here, I mean, the first rule. He does whatever is the most luxuriant thing for him. Next time I'll use that's deer first, intestine to hold I like it up. that. I like that. That's good. No that's, pressure. That's the first rule. That's the first rule. Another one, we, we're not going to shame anybody. You know, don't be, hey, you're not, you're, you're not uh, washing your whatever's with lemon juice or something like that. No, it's like you know, everybody gets to do whatever is their own thing. And then we share the thoughts with it. We share the things that are in my book. And then it's like, if they want to adopt a couple, that's cool. Wait, is I lemon juice better than vinegar? In certain situations. <laughs> oh, boy. It depends. <laughs> it depends. It, it depends. That's so, what you should have right. called the book. <laughs> it, depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends. You're right. Okay. But let's let's get this space nice and warm and toasty for you. And, and the next thing I want to do is, in my book, I, uh, I had a part where it's like, okay, let's come up. Because, like, when we talk about the number one way to reduce your carbon footprint is how you heat your home. And, and immediately, a lot of people get this idea of, like, well, then I guess I have to turn the thermostat down and be cold. And it's like, no, no. I don't want that at all. No, no. In fact, I want you to be warmer. I want you to be so warm you're sweaty and, like, this is, this is disgusting. And, and uh, it's like, Whatever level of disgusting, disgustingly warm in winter that makes you feel opulent, that's what I want. And we're going to cut energy costs way down. Yeah, I was going to mention that. So not just the, the footprint, but the energy cost comes, like most of it's heat, did you say, right? Most, most of your of energy heat. cost, right? Well, I was just thinking yeah. maybe it gets to the point where I'm leaving my garage door open into the house so that I can cut down on my natural gas bill because it's so oh, warm. I'll do the opposite way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay uh uh so let's 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 get this done and one of the things that i talk about in my book so i gave three different ways that you can dramatically cut your uh heat bill by 90 percent or more while being more comfortable the first idea that i gave was to show an example of how to properly use oh, I like incandescent this. I lights. Like this. See, we, we're on board with this already. This one. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, I think that if you're going to uh, uh, put your lights throughout your house like a dumb fuck, and then then it then suddenly all of these shitty LED lights are looking pretty good. But like, here's a thought. How about if you try to be for a moment not a dumb fuck? And like, let's, let's, you know, move the light where it's of more value. And then here's a crazy thing in the winter time, even more so for you guys than for me, the days are really short and that light would be really handy about now. And a little heat would be good too. And by the way, what's the thing the LED people always point out is that 96% of the energy that comes out that is, is for an incandescent light bulb is pissed away on heat. <laughs> that thing that you need in the middle of winter is heat. Now, here's a bizarre thing. This heat that comes off this light bulb isn't just ordinary heat. 
This is especially efficient heat because most people heat their homes with uh, convective heat. They heat the air and the air heats the whole house, which in the turn eventually heats them. It's the least efficient form of heat. But radiant heat, which is what a light bulb throws off, is actually very efficient. And so I want to propose an idea. What if the garage has the door open most of the time? And so then the garage ends up being pretty cold, like, like 40 or 50 degrees. And then when you go in, you turn on the light. And it's like, I'm going to go work at my workbench right there, where those tools are currently a little cool, but not covered in ice. And it's like, all right, so I'm going to go over there and I'm going to turn on all these lights that will illuminate my workspace. And they happen to also illuminate my face and my hands. And now this whole space, I've only been here three minutes and it already feels too warm. It's going to make that much of a difference, all the lights? Try it. Yeah. Try it. Yeah, I Try can see. It. I mean, yeah, I could see that making a big difference. So yeah. insulate it, fill it full of these these lights. Not full of, but... You but know. now you got to keep in mind, don't put the lights on the ceiling. Nobody's yeah, up yeah, there. Yeah. All yeah, right. They have to be where, down. Yeah. Where are you working at? You're on the working, bench. You're yeah. working right here. You yeah. know, it's like, I, you know, illuminate this space. And this is where your hands are, right? Your hands are right there. So you've got this bright illumination on your face, on your hands and on what you're working on. And next thing you know, it's plenty warm. Wow. It's it's plenty warm in just minutes. And what was the point plenty. about leaving the door open to the house? Well, okay, if you go in there and you try and do this and the space is 40 below, it's like it's 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 not going to Okay, so so basically here's what I did. I've got some videos on YouTube that kind of show this. So I've got this one video where we set the room temperature to 50. And we got this little tiny gal so she doesn't she doesn't have all that natural insulation that I sport, right? <laughs> she is she is a thin gal, all right? And and she's wearing normal people clothes. She's not wearing a parka. And so then she sits down at a desk that we've propped up with all this stuff. So she's got a 40 watt light bulb over her head. She's got like a heated keyboard and mouse, and then she's got a dog bed heater at her feet. And we're like, all right, do stuff there, work. Get to work. And and so she's there for like half an hour. And after half an hour, we say, okay, how do you feel? She says, feels warm. And there's a there's a thermometer there, a big one, you know, like like for outdoors. And it's kind of sitting there about a foot and a half away from her. And it shows that the air temperature in the room is 50 degrees. So if, so it's it's too cold. But and then the next thing we do is we say, okay, turn off all, turn off that light turn off the, the heated keyboard and mouse and turn off the dog bed heater at your feet. And it's three minutes and 10 seconds later that she says, all right, my, my fingers are starting to hurt now. I can't type anymore. I'm too cold. So 50 degrees is just too cold. It's too cold to be in there and doing anything, especially if you're not moving around and things. But with, these, with this extra augmented microheaters, it was 82.5 watts of heat this teeny tiny amount of heat. She was perfectly comfortable. She felt like it was And it was, was one bulb, one bulb plus the other things and that's it? One bulb, a single 40 watt bulb. And everything added up to 82.5 watts. Wow. So and it what was... I'm saying is, is that if that space ended up being something on the order of 50 degrees, but you go in there and it's well illuminated, two or three bulbs, Maybe a place where you stand that's, you know, got a dog bed heater under it. I don't know. I'm just making this shit up as I go. <laughs> then it's it's like you try that and you might find that it's like this is too warm. I need to back off a bulb or two. Interesting. Now, here in the United States, the incandescent light bulb has been banned by the government. Uh, I don't know. How, I don't know what the story is. Well, we have the city people, or not, I don't know if they're actually government or pseudo government from the big energy companies going around to houses and doing an audit of your lights and trying to sell you on those. <laughs> uh, 
I'm serious. Okay. It creeped me out. Oh no! They they want to give you a power bar. Audit, they right? want to give you a power bar with certain things on it, and I'm like, I'm, I was like, I ran, I, I still ran. We didn't have like, that here. It was in Calgary, and I'm like, I'm not using that power bar. I'm not plugging all my stuff into that power bar. It's creepy. And then they want to go around and change all your lights for you to these CFL things, CFLs, I guess. Yeah, right. it's just. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here I got to tell you why. Oh, this is this is just amazing because. You know, and they're going to give them to you for free, right? For the and well, the first batch, anyways, I guess. I don't they're know. they're going to give them to you for free, and I'm sure that the reason that they're giving them to you for free is because the people in China love you so much. <laughs> oh, take these light bulbs, you guys are the sweetest. Americans are the best. We slaved away making these, and a bunch of us died making these, but we love you so much. It's free, man fucking free and so and then the guy who brought him over to your house he loves you too man he loves you deep and and so he paid for the fuel to get to your house and bring you these bulbs man it's like uh, his love went went deeper than the bulbs but you just didn't pick up on his signals all right let's let's move along what's what's really going on here because you know china doesn't love you that much and you know that that dude that brought that he doesn't love you that way He's not bringing these bulbs to you unless he's getting paid and paid fat. Is that about right? Yeah. Oh Am yeah. I getting warm here? Yeah. All right. Let's imagine that these bulbs cost $12 a pop to get to our shore. But the light bulb company, who, by the way, who banned those light bulbs? Oh, wait, it was the light bulb company that banned their own product. I wonder why that could be. So basically what it turns out to be is that they got so many different government agencies subsidizing the light bulbs and these different agencies don't know about each other that they're making like 50 bucks a bulb. Oh my God. And so what do you think? Did they have some, some room in there? And it's like the only problem they're having is that nobody likes them. They can't move the motherfuckers. So what do they do? They, they come and uh, they're like, I know, I know what we'll do. We'll send somebody over to everybody's house to do an, an energy an energy audit. I'm trying to do finger quotes. Can yeah, yeah I got thing? it. Yeah, we can the see energy, it. Energy, yeah. energy. We'll call, we'll call it. <laughs> we'll call it an energy audit. <laughs> and they'll fucking believe it. And then they <laughs> and then they give away then they give away the bulbs at a at a little power bar and they get money from the government. Exactly. Oh, Every bulb they move, yeah. they just get this huge amount of money. It's there's they're not giving them to you because they're free. They're giving them to you because they're making bank. Well, isn't there a blue light issue on a lot of those bulbs too? Like you, the incandescent bulbs you're talking about, don't they not give out blue light? All right. Let's. I mean, uh, okay. I don't want to get a down lot that. Of people go are down like, that oh thing, no, but... CFLs. We all know they're terrible. And it's kind of like, well, then why did I have to make that video years ago when everybody kept saying the CFL was our savior? And it's like, okay, all right, all right. Now everybody's keen on the LED made by the same companies. I'm sure they're not playing the exact same game, right? I mean, who would, they're going to turn their, they're not going to take all that money. They, they don't want that money, right? They're going to, they're going to play straight. It'll be honest and stuff. I, I'm sure. But now yeah, let's talk about the blue light. Hey, uh, you guys, what are you guys illuminating your room with there? What's that? It's uh, blue light. That is? Yeah. <laughs> is that blue yeah. light? Yeah, it's all blue light. We, we talked about it years ago, and it was, it was uh, I was in a little phase trying those to get rid of the blue light. And then, oh, no, those? No, oh, maybe. They're like oh. little floodlights. Yeah, maybe. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> so... <clears throat> You've been around LED lights, and you've been around incandescent lights. If you could have your pick about which to be around, which would you pick? Well, incandescent, yeah. Duh. Yeah. yeah. And and it's like you. I'm sure you've been to somebody's house where it's like you guys picked the wrong LED lights. <laughs> this is this is like some kind of prison where they're gonna torture you by <laughs> flickering the lights or something. It's like this. I I'm getting a headache just being here. Uh, and it has everything to do with your lights, nothing to do with you guys, really. Yeah. Serious. No, there's the it's, frequency thing too. Yeah, yeah there's yeah. that. Yeah. There's yeah. there is, and and yeah. it's like um, uh, there's there's a long list of problems. Now, my book, I have a co-author, yay! And this section of the book 
was his baby. Nice. He's like, he's like, he's done the research. And 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 you'll notice that as you look at the book, there's footnote city there. <laughs> and it's like, go look at the references here. And then these, and then this point, and then here's two more. You know, it's like, uh, all right. Yeah, there's the blue light. Very stimulating. It's like uh, having a cup of coffee, whether you want the coffee or not. Because you go to your workplace, and they're like, we've pumped in some blue light for you. We found that we have productivity 6%. Yeah, <laughs> come on in. Sit down in the blue light. Yeah, we got lots of it. We, we're, we got some more bulbs coming tomorrow. It's sweet. And then you, you go home all spent and wiped out and everything, only to turn on your blue lights at home. And uh, so now there's a lot of people where they're working hard to, to reduce the amount of blue light in their lives for, for health purposes. So let's talk about some of these blue lights. If you sit too close to an incandescent light bulb, what happens? You get hot. Oh, yeah. But man. And so you move it away. What happens if you sit too close to uh, the blue light? You don't get hot, but you do get like scarring on your face because of the UV radiation. And so there's gobs of videos on YouTube about that. And it's like, uh, oh, well then uh, it's obvious, you dumbass. Just move the light farther away, see? And it's kind of like, well, part of this is, is like, if you take an incandescent light and you move it close to where you're reading the book or you move it close to where you're working at your workbench or, or whatever, I mean, don't you get plenty of light? You get oodles of light. Yeah. And of course, it's also providing warmth. And if it's like too much warmth, you can move it a little further away. Yeah. I mean, here's what I've got. I've got, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah. See, I've yeah. got one of these. Oh, yeah. One of those these are good. Boys. Yeah. Those are good. Yeah. I got, yeah, I yeah. got one of those. Yeah. Yeah. There you yeah. go. So I'm just going to yeah. talk through this thing the yeah. rest of the time. So it just, because that, that then uh, radiates the heat a little bit more. Uh, it, I can move it up and down. Yeah. I can move it wherever I want. And it's like, if I'm a little cool, I can move close. But here's, here's what I want you to try first. And that, that, that is like, go ahead and, and heat that room up to 72. Put in the lights and the extra heaters that I talked about. Now you're too hot, you know? So go ahead, turn the heat down a little bit in the room. You know, find out what's your, what's your sweet spot. And it's like, without this stuff, without these techniques, you want that room to be perfectly comfortable. You want it to be 72. 72 is the magic number. But you add these things in, next thing you know, you've got the thermostat down to like 62 or even lower. If you add in a couple more lights, you might be able to go down to 50 like that gal did in the video. And it's like, you can so, even, if you, if, depending on a variety of other factors, you could go even lower. So not even the mini, mini rocket mass heater, nothing like that. You're just talking like insulation and lights for now and see. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying know your options. Yeah. And you choose yeah. because every option has upsides and downsides. You do a rocket mass heater. I mean, first of all, if we're going to be in a shop, if it's a space that's only used for four hours every other day, then um, there's a certain design of a rocket mass heater that has a double barrel on the top. And then what that does is it throws off a lot more instant heat, but it stores very little in the mass. And so this is really good for shops because you, you know, it's been two days since you've been in there. A rocket mass heater, the general design is good if you're living in that space all the time. Because then the mass holds the heat for a couple of days, maybe two, five days, something like that. And it's like, um, but with the, uh, the shop, a lot of times you're not in there. So then I'd say like, yeah, make something so that it could heat it up really fast. But again, it's kind of like back to the problem of like your dad going in there and he needs to heat this thing up for three hours before he can use the space. And it's like, let's, let's get that down to like 20 minutes, you know, and then it's plenty warm. So that's an option. I mean, turning on those lights, that's going to be pretty instant. Yeah. Then the next thing is, is like, what if you, uh, what if you got a rocket mass heater in your house and you and you fire that up and you got it plenty warm in the house and maybe you opened up that uh yeah. you opened up that door you know and it and it kind of heated up that space over there too like it didn't heat it up to 70 in there but it heated it up to 60 yeah you know are they hot to the touch on the outside 
a rocket mass heater yeah yeah oh yeah it's it's going to be hot to the touch just like any other wood stove i mean we've had some people that uh, have said like oh don't don't ever get a rocket mass heater because it's hot to the touch and it's kind of like so like don't get any wood burning stoves oh no regular wood burning stove those are fine what have you never touched one of those when it's got a fire in it plus the other thing is a rocket mass heater i mean it's actively burning wood it's only hot to the touch when it's actively burning wood which is for an hour every other day or the conventional wood stove you're probably burning that uh, uh probably four to eight hours a day and so then it's hot to the touch 10 times more often than a rocket mass heater so what else what else do people do functionally with that with that you know three by two and a half by ten foot space Oh, um, I know that one of the things that I do is I have, uh, cause I don't use my clothes dryer. <clears throat> I like to hang all my uh, clothes when I, I run to the wash and I pull them out and I throw them on this clothes drying rack. And I kind of feel like I'm, I'm stacking functions when I put the clothes drying rack on top of the yeah. mass of the rocket mass heater. Yeah. And then it's like, everything gets dried real fast. Yeah. There you go. Um, but there's that, uh, other people sit on it. Um, because, you know, when there's been a fire recently, it's very warm and it, it, you know, comfy. If you've been out in the cold, then it's like, oh, yeah, you want to put your hands, or your butt on that. And that really heats you up fast. Um, I guess, I mean, it would be kind of like, uh, I'm trying to think of like, what would be a similar thing? Like you walk into your home right now and you don't have a rocket mass heater and you've been out in the cold and your fingers are cold and your butt is cold. What do you what do you do to warm your fingers or your butt? I mean, you could warm your fingers by getting some warm water going at the kitchen sink and just running some warm water on your fingers. That'd probably help. But what do you do about heating up your butt? It was is there do you have something that's warm that you could sit on? I mean, it's it's amazing how luxuriant it is when you come in from outside, you've been doing something outside, and then you can plant your butt on the mass and it's like, ah. Whereas What's, I don't know, without it, what do you do? Yeah, yeah, good point. What's it Not insulated? Bad. What's it insulated with? Like, what what kind of materials are are insulated? Are they high with? temp insulation? Yeah. The one in here, uh, we use ceramic fiber. It's a molded ceramic fiber. It's what they use for. Um, in fact, this one's got what's called a puppy burner in it. It's what they use for crematoriums, and this one's for a pet crematorium. And uh, so it's kind of small. Uh, so it's literally called a puppy burner. And uh, so it's uh, this, this thing that they use, um, uh, for, you know, for the crematorium, it gets to a, 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 a super high heat. It can withstand like almost 3000 degrees. Um, <clears throat> so we've got that. And then we've got this uh, riser that is also the ceramic fiber tube that we've shaped. We've kind of cut some of the material away to get it to bond with the puppy burner. And so that's what this one has. Other ones have different materials. Uh, we've got a lot of experiments with different high, but it needs to be high temperature. I mean, we're talking about 2000 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Most of your stuff can't tolerate 2000 degrees. Yeah. So there's no real like lighting it when you throw, when you throw stuff in there, you just throw it in there kind of thing. I mean, oh, to... no, there is a way to light it. And, and every, there's like, uh, I made a, I made a, I want to say a movie. It's like 45 minutes long on five different people in the way that they light a rocket mass heater and so um uh so yeah different people got different style but the thing is is once it's going the fire burns sideways and so um, but when you're looking at it you're thinking like well i'm putting the sticks in here vertically surely the fire is going to burn up these sticks and the smoke is going to fill the house but it's like well one of the steps is you got to kind of prime the riser a little bit um, but if you had a fire recently enough, there's already a pole and you don't need to prime the riser. So, um, uh, but a lot of times what people do is that they'll take a little, uh, wad of paper and they'll set it on fire and then they'll throw it back underneath the riser, let it go for like half a minute and then build the rest of the fire. Then it automatically starts pulling the fire sideways. So it is a little different. I mean, it's a different contraption than a conventional wood stove. Hmm. Um, but I mean, the, you know, massive perks, massive benefits. I'd say 
yeah, you got to light a little bit differently or else the smoke will go the wrong way. But I've, I've lit conventional wood stoves where the smoke went the wrong way. And it's kind of like, what the hell? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's super interesting. So what 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 are some like before we I don't want to forget about your Kickstarter and maybe some of the other stuff that you want. Like, what do you think people need to know in this in this time of, uh, you know, people thinking maybe thinking in the back of their heads? Do I want to move out into the country? Do I want to buy land? Do I want to move away from the city or or maybe just, you know, retire out there? Like, is there any other things people besides going to your website and reading your book? I mean, is there other little things people could should think about? Just to just to take away I, the myth, like take away the myth, because it feels daunting to a lot of people. Like I can't even imagine getting away from the comforts of you know the city life and and doing that. No, I want I want everybody to have all the comforts they love. Yeah, and and it's kind of like I imagine a lot of people would look at you guys and say, "What? You're in a town with only fifteen thousand people? You know why would you choose to suffer like that? And do you guys feel like you're suffering? Well, we're right on the edge of a city of a million and a half, so. <laughs> okay never mind <laughs> I, I withdraw that that comment completely but i love it i All mean right. i was right in the city right in the heart of the city i'm out here in this little town and it's great i love it okay like you were saying i don't want to leave like i'm now i'm at the point no. where i just want to be you know in my home and and what that's if, fine what if i can make a canadian utopia out in the country and I make it so that you could come out there and live and everything costs half. It's, it all costs half. And then on top of that, uh, all the food you eat is made right there on the property. And the food comes from the gardens and animal systems on the property, which, you know, people have come there to get their cancer to go away. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. I mean, like... <laughs> so i think i think there's a lot of people that might have that are living in a city and they're suffering from some sort of ailment but they haven't connected yeah. the two now for one thing is is like it's like you're in the city and you move to almost any place out in the country and now those sicknesses went away but now you have a whole bunch of new sicknesses because your neighbor sprays all sorts of pesticides and it's like there's there's a whole different bunch of problems out in the country generally but it's like if we want to make a little micro utopia then it's like okay we're going to need a big chunk of property here and we need to keep all the sprayers out and whatnot and so <clears throat> i'm thinking that i want you to have all the comfort and at the same time can i make something that cost that that is half the cost and like 10 times the benefit you know and what would that look like and i think it's going to look different from for for most people you know like like if i said here's this house with 20 people and for somehow mysteriously the drama knob has been turned from a nine down to a one but these particular 20 people are like your heroes in life kind of people they are the coolest people in the world by whatever your metrics of cool are and they're saying, oh, yeah, we got a room here. It's, uh, you know, you can, you can rent this room here. It's like, uh, you know, a quarter of what you're paying for a house right now. Yeah. But, hey, you know, it's going to go fast. It's your call. What are you going to do? Yeah. You know, are you going to take it? Do you want to live with these people that are, like, just super, you know? <laughs> and then there's, like, you know, oh, yeah, these people, they cook, and there's gardens out there. It all kind of happens. And uh, I don't really think about it a lot. And, uh, but, but we do, uh, I lived in one house once where there was a guy who came around every night and he wanted to talk about, uh, he always wanted to play this, he wanted to play Scrabble. That's what it was. Every night he wanted to play Scrabble. And sure enough, you'd always find four people who are like, sure, I'll, I'll play Scrabble. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not a big Scrabble person, but <clears throat> it turns out a lot of people are. Um, other places, it's like, going to watch a show tonight. We're going to watch this show. Do you want to see it? And uh, that person over there made a bunch of popcorn, you know. And then uh, this kind of thing. I mean, you know, there's reasons why we don't do it. We've all been there. You, you, we've shared a space with somebody before, and they turned it to be fucking nuts. 
And it's like, there's a damn good reason to never do that again. And at the same time, there's powerful benefits. Yeah. And it's I'm like, so, you know, can we pull it off? Can we do it? Guys, I'm out of time. What's your uh, Kickstarter? Plug that quickly and then we'll uh, let you go. Devious experiments for a truly passive greenhouse. Uh, <laughs> it looks like it's at 75,000 right now. It's got uh, 67 hours to go as I'm speaking. Um, I think if you just go to Kickstarter and you search for my name, it comes up. Yeah. They don't, they don't give you a very pretty uh, URL. I can't like read it. <laughs> You're gonna, it's going to be like a pain in the ass to get that URL to work. All right. Well, but, we'll yeah, we'll put that in here. Cool. Cool. Um, uh, we're funded. We're getting lots of stretch goals now. It seems like we do a Kickstarter every year or two. And it usually does pretty great. Um, and the weird thing is, is that half the money usually shows up in the last few days. So we might hit 150,000. Nice. Before we're done. That's great. Yeah. And what yeah. are you going to do with it? You're going to build a passive greenhouse? Or are you going to experiment with it? We're going to build a truly passive greenhouse. There's a lot of greenhouses out there that say, we're a passive greenhouse. And it's like, except for this big fan that has to run, you know, and it's like this giant, like, you know, it comes on and all the house, all the lights in the neighborhood dim. You know, yeah, except for that fan. <laughs> you know? So um, uh, this is something that's, that's truly passive. And it's like, if it's a success, because of course, if you have a green eyes, you have a lot of glass and that glass does not insulate well. And so it's kind of like, all right, how do we get this to be truly passive and truly warm? So we've got, we've got a bunch of designs going into that. And then nice. uh, and with, with strong success, which we're sure we'll have, then it's like, now let's kind of modify it to be a, a house with a lot of glass. And it's like, uh, I think this is going to be a, a zero energy thing, you know? Nice. That's awesome. And that would be throughout the winter as well in Montana, ideally? Yes. Yes. We'd be using the heat from the summer to heat the structure through the winter. And then having a little passive solar tossed in from time to time. And a problem with a greenhouse is, is that when the sun does hit it, Oh, then a lot hot. of times everything gets too hot and it kills all the plants. So, so part of our design is to take that too hot and totally passively with no moving parts, be able to store that heat for later. Annualized and course, thermal inertia. Yes. Yes. So we're going to use some of that. And we've got a few other tricks up our sleeves, but we documented it all on the Kickstarter page. Oh, that's great. The whole list of all the things to try. But yes, if you read the if you read the book, there's the chapter about annualized thermal inertia. Right now on. that's going to be a little much for some people, but but it's kind of like the first half of the book is for people who live in apartments, and the second half of the book is information that I want people who live in apartments to know about. But really, it's about having some yard space or some acreage. <clears throat> right on. But the thing is, is like people who live in apartments, they know what a nuclear reactor is and why they're good or bad, right? But they don't have a nuclear reactor. And it's like, okay, so, so all I'm doing in the second half of the book is explaining how to do energy without a nuclear reactor. And it's kind of like, hey, wouldn't that be good to know? Wouldn't that be something to tuck away? Yeah, totally. Even if you don't currently have a nuclear reactor. And so, yeah, I, I kind of feel like if this book can get into the brains of 100 million people, yeah most of our global problems would just dissolve yeah they would just not be there anymore right on buddy thanks right for your time on, and yeah. thanks for the work and the inspiration and maybe we'll come visit if they open up this this border like i think we're probably within five or six hours of each other would have to be i can be yeah. in helena in five hours from here <laughs> oh i haven't heard anybody call it that in years helena <laughs> is it helena it's helena <laughs> helena well helena I like Helena. I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna stick, with <laughs> stick with it, man. I'm stick with it. with it. Right on, I, Paul. I, there's a town, not there's a town over in Idaho called Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, oh, I yeah always, it's beautiful. I always spell it C O R E uh, hyphen D U H hyphen L A N E. Delane, and I've had yeah. a lot of people say like, "Oh, people who live in Coeur d'Alene are gonna be super offended by that." <laughs> and that's like that'll make it even funnier. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Right on, buddy. Thanks for All your right, time. Thanks, guys. Okay. Yeah, good, good, luck. good luck with the Kickstarter. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 
And that was a chat with the one and only Paul Wheaton. What'd you think, buddy? Yeah, well, that was good. I thought, glad you uh, we were able to fix some uh, some of your fix some winter of my dilemmas life. coming up. Hey. Yes, the winter dilemma is well. I don't know if it's <clears throat> fixed, I like it. but I got a. Can we still buy those? Can, can we buy those bulbs? I'm thinking I should probably just. I don't think you can get 75 or 100 watts anymore. Is that what it is? Really? They they limited the wattage. But I think like the 100 watts got to be hard on power. Well, it's, but no, but I think it's still worth it for the heat. I mean, it might is be. It? it might be. Yeah. Not if it's up on the ceiling. Not well. That's the thing. Maybe we could yeah. see if we can buy a bunch of old hundred watts on eBay. We'll fill your house up with them and see how the bill looks. Yeah. No I wonder compared to the heat, like the the natural gas. Hmm. Because yeah, I wonder how much. I think I'm paying like four or five hundred a month on utilities. What? Yeah, three three or four at least. Yeah. Are you kidding me? What are you up to over there? What do you mean? What are you paying in this house? My last bill was a hundred and sixty dollars. For for everything? For everything. Is that including the garbage? That doesn't include water. Or? Water is an extra hundred. Okay. Yeah, water and check. sewage and garbage is an extra okay, hundred okay. bucks so a month. Oh, well, I'm That's I was including separate. that. I was including that. So I'm I'm probably over two hundred then, probably two fifty for what you you pay one sixty for. So yeah, I gotta look at that. Probably. You got a guy in the basement. Just just he I don't think he's made a big difference. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, you better look at that. You must be leaking. And the someplace. hot water my buddy Ry came over to fix the hot water tank. He, the the dipper thing was broken. Because I think my gas is that. almost at zero. The gas is for the heat? Yeah, like the only heat I'm using right now is I th- set my thermostat at 60, I think. I actually turned it up the other day to 70 because it was cold. But if it gets cold in here now, I just turn on the gas fireplace for a little bit. Yeah, our, mine's broken. The gas fireplace is broken. Easy place to really run yeah. down over so, there. I'm glad I didn't take it. But that still that's costs. So that's natural gas still, right? But that is that heated better than the rest of the heater? Like the... No, it's just I don't need the furnace on right now if I get cold. You know, if I just turn on that little that stove, I feel like it's less heat for some reason because it's not a forced air thing. It's right. not like – so if I turn on that for like – It's just going out there, but it's warming up your space, and it's not going all over the place. Well, it automatically goes upstairs. Okay. That's what you got to watch is like if it gets cold and rainy, we'll like turn on the fireplace and we'll like be in front of it on the couch doing stuff. And then you'll go upstairs at the end of the night and not think about it, and upstairs will be like – fucking hot yeah because the heat's just constantly rising right. up there it seems like it's less heat and it's nice to have that like you said to sit on that thing it's like when it's cold outside or rainy outside and wet it's nice to have that fireplace to get up close to so what'd you think that was good it's his I feel book like has got, got stuck all on the kinds heaters of for a long time yeah but that's important Do you have because the book? yeah i've got it electronically yeah but we no, should have it for the studio copy, we yeah. should have we'll, we'll order a hard copy for the studio because that's it's an it is a thick, amazing. Because it might be a fun experiment just to try and build one to keep my garage warm all the time. Just see if we could do it. Yeah, yeah. Build a little mini one that I, I could go out there once a day and throw a log in it if I need yeah. to. It wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I mean, that's yeah. it's kind of where I go smoke my dope. So you already got a heater burning in there. It's not quite enough. It's a little cold. I mean, it gets cold in there now, even if it's like cold and rainy at night, and it goes down to like. Yeah. You know, you know how a bird is. It yeah. kind of goes down to single digits all yeah. the time at yeah. night. Yeah. Anyway, big thanks to Paul for coming on the show. You're welcome to come back anytime. Hopefully, we'll make it down to Montana. I mean, we've got a bunch of trips to the States coming up. Hopefully, I'm dying just to get over the border right now. Like, the second, if that thing opens up August 21st, I might go for a little jaunt down wow. to Spokane. I don't think the theme parks can open this year, Silverwood. Mm. It's not looking good. Damn it. I really wanted to go this year. You think Yellowstone's open? I don't know. Anyway, uh, check out Paul's stuff. Check out the show notes. Do all the lovely things in the show notes. Help keep the show going. The biggest thing you can do to help keep this podcast going, if you love it, you're getting maybe just like it. Maybe you love it. Maybe you're getting some value from it, adding a little value to your life. Maybe you can head over to grandamerica.ca slash support. Send a little value back our way. Let us know what the show's worth to you. And uh, help us keep going at the same time and help prepare to be cancel proof, which is what we're trying to do, and maybe get some permaculture going one day. Anyway, anything else? No, I think that's it. Just if you're thinking about doing a greenhouse, go to Paul's uh, Kickstarter. Check, Check out, out the Kickstarter. Paul, Paul Wheaton. Devious experiments for a truly passive greenhouse. The people on the podcast won't. Uh, It'll be over by the time they get this. But Cyrus in the chat's talking about Earthships. The problem, yeah. I, the thing I don't like about Earthships is all the tires. 
And Dennis Hayes is saying, uh, the burn, old a tires puppy, are, burn a puppy a day. The old the tires are a bad idea. Ooh, maybe I could start up a pet crematorium. There you and then go. I can just make use money that. On hey, we were, we were, our old studio was right was next right to one. right next to one. Yeah, we could talk to him. Yeah. We could have heated the old studio off with the, the f- burnt pets. With the pets, yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, actually, do you think it comes out pretty clear if it's that hot? I don't know. Unless you just throw your garbage in the rocket mass heater. We'll just incinerate it and just create heat. Like, hey, have to light you it. You'd have to there. light the fire. Can you use coal in there? Or is that nasty? No, I think you just burn Wood, the one okay, log. Wood's okay, burns okay. Wood's okay. And I don't know. I got to watch not. a video on this. Yeah, you should. It's pretty interesting. He's got, I mean, his website is chock, chock-a-block full of all kinds of goodies. Anyway, guys, thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. Hey, Cyrus retracted his message. Yeah, he retracted his message when I said... <laughs> I, I want the like Earthship it, but... message back. <laughs> Quit self-censoring, Cyrus. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Anyway, uh, thank you guys. Tune in to the live show. We'll be back in like 45 minutes with uh, Kevin Arnett talking residential schools and some other stuff. Oh, we won't be able to do the radio next time, though, because I guess Grim's take will have yeah, it. Yeah.